Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. Welcome to my airplane design tutorial number 11. I discussed the wing platform and its effects on lift and drag in the last tutorial. In this one, I want to provide you with some information on how to select the airfoils for wing and tail for the airplane. The kind of airfoils that are used on the wing have a major influence on how the airplane performs, both in cruise and during slow flight and stalls. Together with the wing plan form, they have to be selected to suit the mission. Of course, you can look up online databases for airfoil coordinates and just pick something that seems to have worked on other airplanes. When I say seems to have worked, I mean, yeah, the other airplane flies, but is that airfoil really a good choice for your project? When it comes to really high performance, as in competition gliders, the designers go all out to develop multiple airfoils tailored for each section of the wingspan that allows them to best get the best glide ratio. These airfoils may have more than 90% laminar flow on the lower surface, and laminar flow equals low drag. If performance matters, custom airfoils are the best choice. Even if you plan on using an ex existing one, you need to know what to look for. So let's go step by step and look at the variables that define an airfoil. An airfoil's main purpose is to create lift with a minimum of drag. So we need a way to show how it performs and compare it with others. Engineers use drag polars with the lift coefficient on one axis and the drag coefficient on the other axis as shown here. The other important chart shows the lift curve with the lift coefficient on one axis and angle of attack on the second axis. Coefficients are used so that we don't have to deal with speed and wing areas, which would make comparisons more complicated. If we would add the dimensions back in, you could plot the speed along this polar, as I have done it for this example airplane, a Mooney. Ideally, the F airfoil stays in its lowest drag range, the drag bucket, during all phases of flight. That does not always work, especially at the upper end. Fortunately, at the upper end, the profile drag is only a small portion of the total drag, because induced drag becomes dominant here, and the airplane does not spend much time in that phase of flight either. Where the airfoil drag really matters, though, is at the lower end, in high-speed cruise. Here we need to make sure that the airfoil does not get past the corner, where the drag coefficient increases again. If that happens, the airspeed airspeed will not increase much, even if the engine power was much higher. The first airfoil variable we need to decide on is the thickness. One aspect here is purely structural. The thicker the airfoil is, the lighter can be the spar. Some applications even require a minimum thickness to be structurally feasible at all. Aerodynamically, a thick airfoil has a higher minimum drag, here shown as CDO1, but maintains that drag over a larger range of CL than a thin airfoil. If you are designing a f an airplane without flaps, a thick airfoil is the best choice. It, the relative thickness is given in percent of the cord. I'll give you some numbers. For a wing, 18% is considered a thick airfoil, 10% is considered a thin airfoil. Tail airfoils may be thinner, in the 8-12% to range. Many times a thick airfoil is used at the wing root for structural reasons and a thinner one at the outboard wing for lower drag. If the airfoil is designed to have a flap, the flap is used to shift the range of low drag up and down. This is called a change in camber. Changing from high camber in slow flight to low camber in cruise improves the efficiency and allows having overall lower drag from using a thinner airfoil. In this sketch, the camber line is shown in red. The camber line is drawn in the middle between upper and lower surface. The further its distance is from the cord line, the higher is the camber. The cord line is the straight line between leading edge and trailing edge. Note that the minimum drag CDO increases a little if the flap is deflected down. While changing the airfoil thickness does not really change the lift curve, Changing the camber does move the lift curve up and towards smaller angles of attack, as the red arrow shows. This means that the airfoil with higher camber has a higher CL max, and it reaches it at a lower angle of attack than the base airfoil. Another parameter is the zero lift angle of attack. 
the zero lift angle of attack on a symmetric airfoil is zero degrees. With increasing camber, a more negative angle of attack is necessary until the airfoil creates no more lift. So what camber do you need for the airfoils? Symmetric airfoils that have no camber are used on tails in order to create the least amount of drag. But wait, on the tail the camber is variable, of course, by the elevator and rudder deflections. Wing airfoils have some camber unless the airplane is intended for prolonged inverted flight. A typical number for a low relative camber would be 1 to 2% of the cord. High camber would be more than 5%. Low camber is used for fast airplanes with flaps. High camber may be used for slow flying airplanes without flaps, where the camber is used to achieve a low stall speed without increasing the wing area too much, like on ultralights. I have plotted here the pitching moment of several airfoils with different flap deflections or camber. Changing the camber changes the pitching moment of an airfoil. The pitching moment of a symmetric airfoil around its quarter chord point is zero. This means that in theory it would not need a horizontal tail to balance it, and airfoils that are designed for no or low pitching moments are indeed used on flying wing designs. As the camber increases, the airfoil wants to rotate nose down, which is by definition a negative moment. We have already seen this in the flap tutorial. The next variable is the station of the greatest thickness. It is given as a distance from the leading edge as a percent of the cord. Depending on the mission of the airplane, the greatest thickness may be as far forward as 25% of the cord. This number is typical for an airfoil used on an aerobatic airplane, where it allows, in combination with a large leading edge radius, high to fly at high angles of attack without stalling. The drawback is high drag and little laminar flow. The opposite is an airfoil with very long laminar flow as it is used on some race planes. This kind of airfoil may have less benign stall characteristics. Watch out though, the stall char characteristics are not just a factor of the airfoil shape, but also of the wing plan form. For two wings with the same plan forms but different airfoils, the main factors that influence stall characteristics are the leading edge radius and the shape of the upper, upper surface. To compare airfoils for these aspects, we look again at the lift curves. The airfoil with a large leading edge radius and well-rounded upper surface loses lift slowly with increasing angle of attack, which is a sign that the flow separation progresses slowly from the trailing edge forward. An airplane with such a wing would mush along wings level with a stick pulled all the way back. The other airfoil, which has a fairly sharp leading edge and a flat upper surface, has an abrupt and large loss of lift once the critical angle of attack is exceeded. An airplane with this wing would rapidly drop a wing when reaching stall and is likely going to enter a spin if the pilot does not recover very quickly. Before computers were powerful enough for airfoil analysis, Wind tunnel data on series of airfoil shape variations were the only things available to an engineer designing a wing. Optimization was rarely done, rather an airfoil was picked from a catalog. For more than 20 years now, engineers have had the software to custom design airfoils for a particular purpose, which allows obtaining much better performance. The variables I have presented here are just the most basic ones. The airfoil shapes can vary in a million, million ways. When designing an airfoil for a particular purpose, the engineer looks primarily at the pressure distribution. At angles of attack above the zero, zero lift angle of attack, the airfoil generates low pressure on its upper surface and high pressure on its lower surface. The area between the curves is the lift that keeps the wing flying. This pressure distribution plot shows CP, the pressure coefficient, along the cord for upper and lower surfaces of a cambered airfoil at low angle of attack. Negative pressure or suction is shown up. As the angle of attack increases, the area between the curves and therefore the lift increases as well. When an airfoil is designed, 
the engineer typically modifies the pressure distribution directly to adapt it for its intended mission rather than the airfoil shape with a program such as XFOIL. This allows better fine tuning. When the viscous flow analysis is turned on, the transitions from laminar to turbulent boundary layer are shown as well as the start of separated airflow. To obtain the drag polars we looked at before, the pressure distributions are calculated for a range of angles of attack. The numbers that we eventually need for the loads analysis for each airfoil are the maximum and minimum lift coefficients for all flap settings, the angle of attack at zero lift, and the pitching moment coefficients. The airfoil shape is used later in the structural analysis. This could only be a small overview of airfoil design, and I hope you now have a better understanding on which airfoil is right for which airplane. I'm done with this video, but I'm not quite done with the wing. Before we can start a loads analysis, I want to review how a complicated wing shape is sim simplified for analysis by introducing the rectangular equivalent wing, its location and the mean aerodynamic chord that I have already mentioned a few times.